was in 1883 in Paris at the Gare de l'Est, the East train station, that an important event was taking place. Sophisticated Parisians stopped for a moment in their rush and watched a beautiful blue train being backed into one of the platforms. Right from the beginning, they knew this was a special train, but they had no way of knowing that at that moment, a legend was being born. It was the inaugural run of the Compagnie Internationale des Bagons Lits et des Grands Express Européens. The company would come to be called Bagon Lee and the train the Orient Express. In the 1870s, crossing the European continent by train was a long, arduous undertaking, requiring numerous changes and custom checks, and the trains of the period were very uncomfortable. It was the dream of the Belgian Georges Nagelmachers to bring a transcontinental express to Europe. He'd been very impressed with the transcontinental railroad in America, and the luxury of its Pullman cars, so he set about to do the same thing in Europe. It wasn't easy. He worked for years to acquire the track rights from the numerous monarchs of Europe, for the Orient Express would pass through many different countries. He was finally successful with the help of a family friend, King Leopold of Belgium. Leopold later became a regular passenger on the train. The Orient Express would tie the capitals of Europe together, Paris, Munich, Vienna, Budapest, Bucharest, and the capital of the Ottoman Empire, Constantinople, today's Istanbul. During the first years of the train, some carriage and water transportation was required to complete the route, but by 1886, the entire 1,500-mile journey would be made without changes in 73 hours. The Orient Express was also known for its great luxury as well as speed. This was the transportation of the aristocracy, the rich, the famous, and the infamous, and it would serve Europe for 90 years. But with the advent of jet travel, the Orient Express declined, until finally in 1977, Wagon Lee decided to discontinue the train completely. It was then that a Swiss company, Intraflug, based in Zurich, bought up many of the old cars, restoring them beautifully. Twice each year, Intraflug makes a nostalgia run with these antique cars across the continent of Europe, recreating the experience of riding on the old Orient Express. These nostalgia trips vary slightly each year. They're always extravagant, and everything is done with typical Swiss meticulousness. Kathleen Dushek, a young documentary filmmaker from California, came prepared to record one of these journeys with her camera. This is her story. I arrived in Paris ready to make a film on the Orient Express. After months of research, I was well steeped in the history and the legends of the train, but nothing I had read could have prepared me for what I was about to experience. Right from the beginning, it was a grand occasion. As would happen all along the route, music had been arranged to greet the passengers. There were train buffs and honeymoon couples and anniversary couples. Nearly all of my 70 fellow passengers were experienced travelers. We had come expecting the ultimate. We were not disappointed. Then the call went up. En voiture, all aboard. And we were on our way. Our nostalgia trip followed the same route as the inaugural journey in 1883. It took us five days. The first day, we crossed France, passing through the area of Champagne, Champagne, stopping to visit in its ancient capital city of Reims, then on towards Strasbourg. The compartments of the Orient Express are comfortable, but decidedly short on space. Each compartment has its own day couch that makes into one or two beds and each compartment has its own wash basin with hot and cold running water. All the sleeping cars were built in the 1920s for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Wagon Lee. They were designated LX types, known to be exceptionally luxurious. All of these cars have been restored and renewed, but never reconstructed. 
for those five magic days we lived on well-preserved museum pieces. It was as if we were traveling in another time. The ambiance, the impeccable service. There was always a conductor waiting in the corridor in case a passenger should want for anything. Within half an hour of departure, everyone had finished unpacking, so we gathered in the bar car. This was a chance to get to know our fellow travelers. Already, the Orient Express was spinning and weaving her spell that would bond us all together. The Orient Express first stop was the city of Reims, or Reims. This city is famous for its great cathedral built in the 13th century. Many of the kings of France were crowned here. Reims is also important in the making and distribution of champagne wine. There was an invitation for us passengers to visit Moom and Company, one of Champagne's finest vintners. We toured their cellars and saw a demonstration of degorgement, the taking of sediment out of the champagne bottle. There was also a demonstration of just how much pressure was in the bottle. Of course, we tasted the new wine and discussed it with its creator. Then we were ushered into another cellar where we were treated to a four-course luncheon, each course accompanied by a different champagne. After all that great food and champagne, we were ready to get back to our compartment for a little siesta. The Orient Express was moving on. For the crew of this train, there is very little rest. Food service is still done by Wagon Lee with a French crew. I was very impressed with the waiters, wearing uniforms decades old in design, with ankle-length spotless white aprons. So obviously proud of their profession, these men have trained for years. They are the best at what they do. Only the best work on the Orient Express. Here too, everything is done in the old way. I especially like the ritual of folding the napkins in the old Wagon Lee winged style. Papa deftly folded 70 of these for every meal. Under swinging, banging copper pots, the kitchen crew was equally as amazing. Over a coal-burning stove, Chef Pierre created five and six course gourmet French meals for up to 120 people. He did better swaying than most chefs do, absolutely stationary. On the old Orient Express, the menu was extensive. Nothing was thought too much. On our journey, there was a fixed menu, but still extravagant. The fish course that first evening, a bit of lobster. These dining cars were also built in the 1920s. They were decorated in Paris by René Lalique. The list of the people who have eaten at these tables is truly mind-boggling. Just a few examples, there was the Empress Elizabeth and Crown Prince Rudolf, the Aga Khan, the Ali Khan, the Maharaja of Kuch Bahar, the Duke of Windsor, and Mrs. Simpson were regulars. Also celebrities like Sarah Bernhardt, Harry Houdini, Matahari, there was Mahler, Strauss, Diaghilev, Nijinsky, Toscanini, the list goes on and on. Many historic events took place on the Orient Express. It was in Wagon Lietz dining car number 2419 that the armistice was signed ending World War I. The car became the symbol of that event and was displayed in a museum for years after. But with the occupation of the Nazis, Hitler claimed the car, dancing beside it with glee. He then forced the French to sign their surrender at that same table where the Germans had met their shame. The car was then taken to Berlin, where it was stored. Finally, with Allied bombing, it was destroyed completely. Our thoughts were very far from such things, our first night on the Orient Express. It was oh so easy to slip into the customs of royalty. While we dined, the conductors were hard at work making up the compartment for the night. All was done at high speed, for everything had to be completed before the passengers returned. It all had to look as though it had been done by magic. On the old Orient Express, the conductor was absolute master of his car. 
proud professionals, these men were required to speak at least three languages. They were well versed in first aid and very accustomed to the habits of kings and eccentric rich. Their responsibilities were many, and some of them took on international proportions. When four-year-old Crown Prince Boris of Bulgaria was misbehaving, one conductor even had the responsibility of spanking his royal posterior. There are many conductors' legends that have been handed down. My favorite happened in 1886. It was in January at exactly 2.32 a.m. that a scream cut through the Orient Express. The door of compartment 7 burst open, and its occupant, Basil Zaharov, the armaments king, found a hysterical Doña Maria at his feet. She'd fled from her husband, the Duke of Marchena, who was mad and had tried to murder her on this their wedding night. And so Zaharov took Maria in, and thus began a 40-year liaison. The Duke was committed to a sanitarium, and Maria and Zaharov were never apart from that night on. Always they rode on the Orient Express, he in compartment 7, she in compartment 8. Finally, they were married 38 years later upon the death of the Duke. For their honeymoon trip on the Orient Express, they could finally share the same compartment. And Zaharov's wedding gift to Maria was the Casino of Monte Carlo. Tragically, Maria died 18 months after the wedding. Zaharov was desolate. He rode the Orient Express one last time, then never took the train again. After Maria's death, Zaharov became a recluse. He died many years later. The night after his death, his loyal bodyguard boarded the Orient Express, taking compartment 7. At exactly 2.32 a.m., at the exact place on the tracks where the two lovers had met, the bodyguard carried out Zaharov's dying wish. He tore into pieces the photograph of Maria that Zaharov carried in his wallet for 47 years. He then opened the window and threw the pieces to the night. The circle was completed. Work begins early on the Orient Express. Five o'clock, the conductors are up lighting the coal stove at the end of each sleeping car. This heats the water that flows into each compartment. The passengers must always have hot water and warmth. At eight o'clock, Heinz, our conductor, gently tapped at the door, waking each passenger in their particular language. There is nothing quite so wonderful as sleeping on a train. Although, making ready for the day had its challenges, these compartments are cozy. It gives the couple a chance to get really close. While we were sleeping, the train had crossed Germany. That second morning, we passed into Austria for a short stop in Salzburg, and then on to Vienna. As always, Austria was breathtaking. These mountains have drawn men here since prehistoric time, seeking the rich treasure of salt. The train stopped in Salzburg for several hours. Salzburg has always been an independent city, loosely associated with the Holy Roman Empire. It was ruled over by the Prince Archbishops, who were religious as well as political leaders of the city. They brought architects from Italy, which gave Salzburg its open places and its mammoth cathedral. I liked Salzburg very much and felt a deep sense of tradition as I walked its streets. In fact, I found this sense of tradition true throughout Austria. Often women wear the Trakten, the dirndl skirts of the region. This wasn't a special day. They frequently wear these dresses. The Getreidegasse is the main street of the old city, always filled with shoppers. It is on this street in 1756 in the old yellow house that Mozart was born. He called this place home for the first 26 years of his short life, and his influence is still very much felt in Salzburg today. It was time for us to be getting back to the train. The Orient Express was moving on. Always, there are fresh flowers in each car of the Orient Express, and lunch was only slightly less spectacular than dinner. Our second day's lunch, duck in orange sauce. The waiters swayed gracefully to the train. I never saw them spill a drop. We were beginning to wind right along the shore of the Danube. Lots of time to linger over lunch, talking with new friends. A 
Ahead on the tracks, preparations have been made for the arrival of the Orient Express. For 12 hours, the fires have been stoked in the fireboxes of three steam locomotives. These locomotives were built in the 1940s and are owned by a private collector in Vienna. Normally, they stay in this yard for derelict cars, but today they've been painted, polished, and made ready, for they will pull the Orient Express. Our meeting place was the city of San Polten. It was here the Orient Express was attached to the first two of the steam locomotives. It was here I finally met with the Swiss owner of the Orient Express, Albi Glatt. With him, Edmund Brenner, the Austrian owner of the steam locomotives. This is a special breed of men training is in their blood. They had been planning this event for months and proudly invited me to come along for a bit of line siding. I had no idea what that was, but I said, of course. By car, we rushed outside the city just in time to watch the Orient Express pull out of the station. I was told that not quite so much black smoke was necessary. The engineers were showing off. As I said, I was invited for line siding. We got back in the car, rushed ahead. I soon figured out what they were talking about. They may call it line siding. I call it train chasing. The car pulled right alongside the train. Then I'd hang out of the window, somebody holding onto my belt, and balance the camera as best I could to get that perfect shot. As soon as I got it, they pulled me back in the car. The chauffeur would race ahead at breakneck speed through twisting mountain roads. Then we'd get to the next good spot. I'd get out quick, set the camera up as fast as possible. The train would come rushing through. As soon as I got that shot, I'd throw the camera back in the car and we'd race on to the next place. Three of the most exciting hours of my life. The Orient Express made a stop to pick up the third locomotive. We were heading into steeper mountains, more power was required. The whole village had come out to watch. There were train enthusiasts from literally all over the world. This was historic, it had never happened before. Three steam locomotives pulling the Orient Express up through the Vienna woods. Some of the passengers had special permission to ride up with the engineer. It was a great honor. Albi Glatt was like a proud father. He was the one who insisted on the Orient Express being preserved so perfectly. Mm, yes, he's eccentric, and he loves trains. Once we reached the summit, it was an easy coast down the other side toward Vienna. A wise old Viennese friend of mine told me once that it would take a lifetime to understand the spirit of this city. Well, I only had one afternoon, but I did my best. Wien. 
Vienna. It was once the heart of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Habsburg family would reign here for 650 years from their imperial palace, the Hofburg. The Habsburgs had a gift for diplomacy and marrying well. They would expand their empire from the lowlands and Spain on the west to Poland and Bulgaria on the east. In 1859, the Emperor Franz Josef ordered that the old medieval wall of Vienna should be torn down and in its place, a wide belt of boulevards was built round the inner city. It came to be called the Ringstrasse. On it stands the Parliament, City Hall, the University, and other great buildings and monuments of Vienna. The Ringstrasse is a delightful place to stroll on a warm afternoon. I walked over to the Opera House, world famous it has maintained a caliber of excellence equaled by few places on earth. Everywhere, I saw evidence of the importance of music in Viennese history. This city has drawn musical greats for centuries. Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, and Strauss, just to name a few. The Pestzoila stands on the Graben. It was placed there in thanks for the deliverance of Vienna from the plague of 1678. This street was also built on the battle line, where in 1683, the Turkish army was defeated and turned into retreat, saving Vienna from the Ottoman Empire. Also in the inner city is St. Stephen's Cathedral, built in the 12th century. This cathedral was damaged badly in the last war. Much of what stands today is reconstruction. Filming there on the Kartnerstrasse, the old shopping street filled with people, I was surrounded by the special pace of Viennese life. Of course, there was music everywhere. In the inner city is the famous Hotel Zacher, one of my favorite places. Over 150 years ago, Franz Zacher had the brilliant idea of combining chocolate cake, apricot preserves, and bittersweet chocolate icing. He called it the Zacher Tort. It made him rich and it made him famous. In fact, the tort is really the reason for this hotel. You can't come to Vienna without having a slice. They make 1,500 of these cakes every day. 75,000 are shipped around the world each year. Not far from the center is Schönbrunn, the summer palace of the Habsburgs. This was Maria Theresa's favorite place. Her reign of 40 years was only outdone by Franz Josef. He reigned for 68 years, the golden age of Vienna. Schönbrunn's gardens reflect the memory of that time when Vienna held many of the world's greatest minds and much of its culture. Schönbrunn means beautiful spring or source. They say that in the 18th century, the Emperor Matthias was riding his horse one day and he found a spring bubbling out of the hill. He was so touched with its beauty that a palace was built on that spot. To this day, one can still drink the clear water from that spring he found centuries ago. It was getting late and there was one custom I did not want to miss. Each afternoon, every Viennese has a favorite cafe where they stop for a cup of coffee. When the Turks fled from Vienna, they left behind bags of coffee beans. It became an essential of life. Always in Vienna, a cup of coffee arrives with a glass of water on the side and a spoon balanced across the top. It is the tradition. When the Ringstrasse was built, a serious housing shortage was caused in Vienna. People lived in crowded quarters. For relief, they came to the cafe, ordered one cup of coffee, then read the newspaper or talked with friends for hours without ordering another thing. I was told that today, the Austrian government must subsidize these cafes. When people only order one cup of coffee, it's difficult to stay in business. Yet, they would not consider giving up the custom. 
The sun was getting low. It had been a long day, but it wasn't finished yet. I rushed back to the train for a quick change into my finest clothes. There was an invitation for dinner. The passengers had been invited to a gala ball at the Pallavicini Palace. This palace was built in the 18th century and is still privately owned by the Pallavicini family. Dinner was served course upon course. There was good Austrian beer and a delectable beef tenderloin wrapped in pastry. And then, as if we hadn't had enough that afternoon, we were treated to another slice of Zachertort. The chocoholics were going out of their minds. And then the entertainment began. The National Ballet of Austria had come to perform just for us. Then the call went up. Time to return to the Orient Express. But none of us was ready for bed. We gathered in the bar car for a little more champagne and music as the Orient Express carried us on into the night towards Budapest. On the third day, I woke to the soft rolling hills of Hungary. It was here I began to appreciate the slow evolution of rail travel from west to east, not the cultural jolt of a jet flight. After crossing into Hungary during the night, we spent the morning of the third day in Budapest and then went on that afternoon to cross the plain of the Pusta. It was still very early in the morning when we pulled into Budapest station. But even then, they had prepared a welcome for us. There were dancers and crowds of people. Budapest lies on the Danube. This is actually two cities connected by bridges across the river. On the right bank is the city of Pest, and up on the hill, the old city of Buda. I have spent a lot of time in Budapest, and so when the train stopped for a few hours, I got out and visited a few of my favorite places. First, Castle Hill in Buda. This city suffered terrible damage in the Second World War, and then again in the Revolution in 1956. They worked hard at restoration, St. Matthias Church is reflected in the very modern windows of the Hilton Hotel next door. To me, this reflects the feeling of Budapest, deeply rooted in the past, yet very much looking towards the future. Pest is more modern than Buda, and larger, with wide boulevards and a large shopping district. It is here one gains a feeling for what life is like for the citizens of this city. For many years, Hungary has been one of the most affluent countries in Eastern Europe. Industrious private enterprises popped up everywhere and is doing very well. I was especially impressed with the produce stands right on the street. Always, you see, paprika. It is an Hungarian staple. 
While the passengers were sightseeing, back at the station, the Orient Express was receiving her daily bath. I was astounded at how careful everyone was as they washed and polished and filled her tanks with water. They love this train and know she is unique in all the world. The railroad is the main means of transportation in Eastern Europe, so the stations are always crowded with people. One of my favorite pastimes on this trip was watching the people watch the train. At each station, the clothes were a bit different, but always people would promenade past looking at this ghost from long ago. I was especially interested in the fellow in the gray sweater. He just had to walk over, and he just had to touch. That's all. And then he went on his way. Soon, we were on our way, too, out of Budapest. And heaven forbid we should go for even a few hours without food. Lunch was served, but this time we were serenaded by gypsy minstrels. This was a reenactment of the inaugural trip in 1883. It was then gypsies boarded the train and serenaded the passengers all the way across Hungary. Outside, the hills were beginning to flatten down into a plain, and ahead on the tracks, the next steam locomotives were waiting. But these were very different than in Austria, much larger. The Hungarian railroad is in the final stages of converting to diesel and electric power, although steam is still occasionally used for freight trains. These two locomotives bear the scars of wars and revolutions and years of hard work. They've been brought out on this day just for us. Now, stretching in all directions around us, absolutely flat, was the plain of the Pusta. After all the gypsy music and Hungarian wine, we were in a great mood and had gone back to our compartments. I was sitting there, looking out the window, when suddenly, riding up beside us, were Hungarian horsemen with bandanas pulled around their faces. They cracked whips over their heads. We were in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Yet, the train slowed and stopped. And then, the horsemen began to carry away the women. They began to load them onto a wagon. Eastern Europe was a problem for the Orient Express in the early days. Hijackings were a constant threat. Of course, we were in absolutely no danger, even though some of our passengers were being swept away by complete strangers. Not to be left behind, we climbed into some other waiting wagons and bumped our way after them out to Etonia, a working ranch where the local people had planned a welcome for us. Pusta is known for its fine horses and the extraordinary relationship of these horses to their masters. We were shown some equestrian skills. Amazing feats. Although there were those that were totally unimpressed. Then they couldn't resist. The men rounded up some of the younger horses and began to circle them around us in great clouds of dust. Late 
in the afternoon, we got back in the wagons and bumped our way to the village of Fort Tabaj. There we met again with the Orient Express, all of us blissfully tired and covered in dust. Time to hit the shower car for a hot shower and then back to my compartment for a rest before dinner. This was one of my favorite times on the Orient Express. The landscape washed golden in the setting sun. During the night, the Orient Express crossed into Romania. The morning of the fourth day, we passed through Transylvania, climbed over the Carpathian Mountains, stopping in the afternoon in Bucharest. I woke early that morning, just lying in bed, watching the Transylvanian sunrise pass by. Sigishvora sits high atop one of the hills of the Transylvanian Alps. For me, this is a place where time has stopped. It was here in Sigishvora in the 15th century that Prince Vlad Dracul was born. He came to be called Vlad the Impaler because of a nasty habit of impaling his enemies on stakes. In the 19th century in England, Bram Stoker read the story of Vlad. He then concocted the tale of Dracula after him. Stoker had never been to Romania. The story has almost nothing to do with the original character. Yet the local people have come to tell the legend of Dracula. They told me it's just good for tourism. Transylvania. Here, horse carts are more common than cars. There's an atmosphere, a spirit, that's difficult to describe, but the spell of it lingers over me even today. Grand Castle is often called Dracula's Castle, although that's really impossible. It wasn't completed until centuries after old Vlad's death. Still, I thought it really looked the part. It was after the city of Brashov that we began our slow ascent into the Carpathian Mountains. The aristocracy of Europe considered the Orient Express its personal means of transportation. They took it for granted. King Carol II of Romania flew into exile aboard the Orient Express, carrying the bare minimums of hasty travel, his mistress, Lupeshka, and 200 bags. Prince Boris of Bulgaria liked driving the train. He would wait until they were just over the border until Bulgaria, then he would pull the emergency brake, the train would screech to a halt, and a prince would insist upon driving. Well, you can't refuse a prince in his own country. They had to let him drive. Alas, Boris was a real speed demon, endangering the lives of all on board. So, diplomatic pressure was put on Boris never to drive the Orient Express again. At Pleshti, the next steam locomotive was waiting for the Orient Express. This one was by far the most powerful, the most modern of all those along the trip. Only one engine is required to pull the entire train. In Romania, steam power is still used for freight trains and even occasionally for passenger trains. I was asked to ride in the cab. Everything was spotlessly clean, no small thing, considering they were constantly shoveling black sooty coal into the firebox. We had finally wound our way out of the mountains and were now crossing the flat, fertile plain that surrounded the city of Bucharest. Bucharest is the capital of Romania, and I've got to admit, I was surprised when I arrived here. 
It's not at all what I'd expected after Transylvania. It is a very modern city with wide boulevards and tall modern apartments. I love the hodgepodge of the architecture of the city. Everywhere I saw the influence of the invading cultures that have swept across Romania through the centuries. The Romanian church has always been well attended. It was Saturday, and that's wedding day in this city. There was a wedding at each church I passed. Everyone all dolled up for the occasion. My only regret was having to turn down all the invitations to join the party. The Romanians are a fiercely independent people. Their history is ancient, back to the time of the Romans. These people would retain their basic Latin culture, even though they would be occupied for centuries by the Turks, the Austrians, and the Russians. The Romanian language is an island of Latin in Slavic Eastern Europe. Everywhere there are signs with words that are familiar to Westerners. Italian speakers, with some effort, are understood here and many Romanians speak English very well. The Romanians were very curious about the United States, although they already seemed to know a lot about us. I was told Dallas was aired on Romanian TV each week in English with Romanian subtitles. Yes, they know all about JR in Romania. It was a beautiful afternoon in Bucharest. I walked over to the city park. It was time to watch the children sweet, beautiful faces. I like these people. They made me feel welcome, and I know that I will return. But for now, the Orient Express was moving on. By that fourth afternoon, we'd all grown accustomed to the lifestyle of living on a train. We all had our ways of passing the time. By this point, we had grown together like a family, passengers and crew. One of the reasons we'd all gotten so close was the corridor. back to the last car of the train and watched the rails pass below us. Ah, oh, they'd gone too quickly. Already it was our last night. That last dinner, we were all quieter, just soaking in the atmosphere. That night, the Orient Express crossed Bulgaria. The next morning, we entered Turkey. Three visas were required to make this journey, one for Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. Although border crossings were simple, we were designated VIPs. They were expecting us, so things went smoothly. We have begun the last leg of our journey to the Orient. The Turkish steppes are known for their severe winters. The winter of 1929 was exceptionally bad. It was in this area, seven hours short of Istanbul, that the Orient Express was forced to a stop and completely buried in snow. For three days, the passengers and crew lived buried alive. They rationed food and burned furniture for warmth, but with no rescue in sight, they saw they had no choice. They began to tunnel out. 
It took two more days and a lot of frost-bitten fingers. Then several crew members waded through chest-deep snow to a village where they bartered for meager food. Close to starvation, nearly frozen, rescue finally arrived from Istanbul seven days later. It was hard to believe that the story was true that afternoon as we passed through the countryside. It was in this area that I felt most like a time traveler. Whole villages came out just to watch our passing, and the scenes outside the window could have been a hundred years ago. Our last lunch was a celebration. The chef came out with his waiters to receive their accolades. He told me he loses between five and 10 pounds on every round trip of the Orient Express. Well, he may have lost them, but we certainly found them. As we neared Istanbul, the rain began to fall. Passing the Sea of Marmara, amazed Turkish faces looked up to watch our phantom blue train pass. On the old Orient Express, it took 73 hours to travel from Paris to Istanbul. This nostalgic trip has taken five splendid days. Ahead of the station, literally hundreds of people had collected to greet us. In Istanbul, they do nothing in a small way. They had prepared a sultan's welcome for the Orient Express. Istanbul, before that called Constantinople, and before that, ancient Byzantium. This city actually lies on two continents, for it is on the Bosphorus, which divides Europe from Asia. And for me, Istanbul is a crazy confusion of those two cultures, European and Oriental, mixed together. Waking early the next morning, I came down out of my hotel into Taksim Square. Oh, I knew I was in Istanbul. I decided to do in Istanbul, as I'd done all along the trip, just get out, walk around, and experience the city. I walked out over the Golden Horn, across the Galata Bridge. This is a pontoon bridge. You can see it's floating on the water. At water level, there are shops and restaurants. It was here the men collected to drink tea and coffee and smoke the hookah. As a woman, I noticed a great contradiction in the city. In public places like this, I didn't see many women. Yet, I was constantly meeting Turkish women in high positions of authority in business and in the government. I was told this dates back to the time of the Sultan, when the Sultan's wives and high-born women had great power and influence, although common women generally stayed behind the scenes. On the other side of the Galata Bridge is Old Stambul. It's here. I felt most like I'd arrived in the Orient. The spice market, the noise, the confusion of people. I climbed up the hill through narrow, crowded, winding streets and came to the entrance of the Grand Bazaar, the covered market. An amazing place, the forerunner of modern shopping centers. It is a city unto itself. Under one roof, there are over 4,000 shops, 12 mosques, several schools and restaurants. You could find most anything your heart desires here. Although, let me warn you, if you do find something you like, be sure to buy it right then. Because if you're expecting to come back later and find that same shop, chances are you'll never find it again in this labyrinth of tiny streets. Higher up on the hill, I could look out over the roof line of the Grand Bazaar. It is very expansive and quite beautiful. 
The history of Istanbul is ancient. There was a culture in this spot as far back as the 13th century BC. The Romans came here and built a great city they called Byzantium. Many of their ruins are still standing. There was the Hippodrome. 60,000 spectators would come here to watch the horse races and the circuses that were held. Byzantium would eventually come to surpass the city of Rome itself as the capital of the Roman Empire in the fourth century under the first Christian emperor, Constantine. The city came to bear his name, Constantinople. With Constantine came Christianity. Hagia Sophia was originally a Christian church, then turned into a mosque. Today it is used as a museum. When the Turks came to Istanbul, they brought with them Islam, and they built literally thousands of mosques in this city. My favorite is the Blue Mosque. It derives its name from the intense blue color of its many stained glass windows and tiles. Not far away, on the third hill of Old Stambul, is Topkapi, with its commanding view of the Golden Horn and the Bosphorus. Topkapi was the imperial palace of the sultans, the absolute rulers of the Ottoman Empire. They would reign here for nearly four centuries. At the height of their empire, when the sultans ruled much of the world, 4,000 people would live within the walls of Topkapi, all to serve the sultan and to administer his government. My favorite part of Tokapi was the harem. In its 400 rooms, the Sultan's many wives lived with their children, always carefully watched by the black eunuchs. I was told that one of the Sultans had over 700 wives and concubines. He must have been a busy fellow. The sultans also had unimaginable wealth. Among their most famous possessions was the Spoon Maker Diamond, the fifth largest in the world, 86 carats. The railroad arrived in Istanbul in 1886. The tracks were laid right through the walls of the Topkapi itself. It is on these tracks that the Orient Express arrived for most of its years of service into Istanbul. When passengers arrived on the Orient Express, they would most certainly stay at the Pera Palace Hotel. This was the place in Istanbul. Built in the 1880s, this was a grand hotel of the European style, although certainly decorated very orientally. Today, the Pera Palace is not what it once was, but still, there is that atmosphere of the old days. Many famous people stayed here, but there are two in particular that I'd like to talk about. On the second floor, one of the suites has been turned into a museum to Ataturk, the father of the Turkish Republic. He is dearly loved by the people of this country. Ataturk would wrench Turkey into the modern Western world in one decade. He changed the system of writing from Arabic. He made every person in this country choose a last name, They've never had that before. He also made it illegal for women to wear the veil and men to wear the fez. Well, no self-respecting Turk at that time would go without a hat on his head. So an emergency run of the Orient Express was organized. At every stop the train made in Europe, they bought up every possible hat, stuffing them in the compartments, racing them to Istanbul to save all the bare-headed Turks. Two floors up is the room of Agatha Christie. They say it's here she always stayed when in Istanbul. They say it's here that she wrote Murder on the Orient Express. In the 1930s, Agatha Christie disappeared for a week, causing an international mystery and scandal. To this day, no one knows where she was during that time, although some say she was in this room. 
Years later, a maid was cleaning by the door where she discovered a loose floorboard. Underneath, she found one of Agatha's special keys. No one knows why it was there. All these years later, she left us a bit of mystery. Two days after arriving in Istanbul, I returned to the station to watch the departure of the Orient Express back for Paris. A whole new group of passengers was there waiting to board. I was going to be flying back to Paris myself the next morning, but I thought I'd stop by to say goodbye to my friends among the crew. I'd made good friends, but most of all, I'd come to say goodbye to the Orient Express. Standing on the platform, watching the passengers board, I was filled with longing. I wanted to get on with them. I, I wanted to be back on the Orient Express. Hines smiled and waved goodbye. I heard the sound of the weight of the train beginning to move on the rails and smelled the smoke from the locomotive. I felt like a child left behind by some wonderful parade. I'd been over, under, and through every inch of the Orient Express. For five days, I'd lived on the energy that bumped and clacked and rolled through all the old cars. If it's possible to fall in love with glass and wood and steel, then I have been smitten, for I do love that old train. In 1977, the Orient Express made her last run from Paris to Istanbul, a sad shadow of her former self, ugly, dirty, and uncared for, really no more than a second-class stop train. She'd been murdered by the advent of jet travel. The Orient Express was finished. Because of the love of a few dedicated people, she has been reborn so that an old time, a style, would not be forgotten. So for a few days, we could experience what it was like to ride on the Orient Express. I have done it, and I know I will never be the same. <laughs>